Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Oliver Westmoreland. I am an IC registered Level 3 advisor and I am Senior Immigration Lawyer with GSM Immigration. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel and click on the bell icon so that you can continue to watch our extremely interesting videos about UK visa and immigration advice. Now, the topic that I'm going to talk about today is something that sounds uh, very technical. I'm going to try and uh, demystify it a bit. Um, I'll, I'll give it to you straight. FLRFP applications. Let me explain what that means a bit. There is um, a big thing in the UK immigration rules, family rules, um, some home office jargon, appendix FM. Now, if you get involved in this area, you're, you're going to have to know this, appendix FM. This is the, the main part of the immigration rules that gives the rules for family visa applications. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about partner applications, that is spouse, Civil partner, civil partner is same sex relationship. Um, unmarried partner, that is same sex or different sex uh, relationship. People living together in a relationship like marriage. Um, there is also fiance visa. I'm not going to be talking about that today because it's not part of what we're talking about. We're going to talk about spouses, civil partners, and unmarried partners. These come in under this um, appendix FM uh, scheme of the immigration rules family immigration rules and if your application is completely perfect if you meet all the requirements you make an application it's called an FLRM application the reasons are too technical for a normal person to understand but that's what it's called FLRM application if you already have immigration leave of some kind if you have um a genuine relationship, of course, it always needs to be a genuine relationship, there's, there's no way around that. If you meet the financial requirements, if you meet the accommodation requirements, if you meet the English language requirements, and you have a sort of a, pretty much a perfect application, you can make an application under what's called FLRM, this is computer language more or less, it's a sort of online application, this is the online application that must be made, FLRM. If you don't meet all the rules, you still might be able to apply under Appendix FM, but you would have to apply under a different part, FLRFP. I don't quite know what it stands for, but it stands for something apparently. This is where you don't quite meet all the rules. You might not hold leave. You must have a genuine relationship, there's no way around that at all. You might not meet the financial requirements. You might not meet the accommodation requirements. You might not meet the English language requirements. Now, as I, as I was uh, strongly indicating, genuine relationship is always a requirement, in, no matter what, in any sort of family visa application. But all the other ones, uh, they're um, slightly negotiable, if you can put it that way. You can't make the application under the FLRM route. You might be able to make the application under the FLRFP route. But it's not easy. Um, it is an alternative, it's not an easy alternative. If you're applying as a partner of a, a person who is a, a sponsor, who could be a British citizen, could hold um, settled status or settlement, or indefinitely to remain, uh, a few other possibilities as well, could hold, for example, pre-settled status. You're applying as a partner of a, of a, a sponsor of one of those types. You can apply it under uh, the FLRFP route, as it's called. The big snag, problem and difficulty is that to succeed in this application, you must show, uh, th these are legal words, you must show that there are insurmountable obstacles to um, being able to have your relationship somewhere outside the UK, you know, uh, in, for example, the, the country that the, the applicant comes from, Pakistan, China or America, you, you must show that there are some insurmountable obstacles as the legal words go to you continuing your, uh, your, your, your married life, your civil partnership life, unmarried partner life in a foreign country or anywhere else. Now, insurmountable obstacles sounds a very 
high and harsh test, and it is. This has been something that's been established in the courts. Uh, this legislation came in a few years ago now. It's been examined in the courts very thoroughly. What, what does it really mean? The senior courts, they look at the immigration rules, they get cases in front of them, they have to decide what does the immigration rule mean? You know, what was the intention of Parliament? Immigration rules have been through Parliament uh, and they express that they're deemed to express the will of Parliament, they're deemed to express what Parliament wants, really. You know, we live in a, a constitutional democracy, that's how it works. But th there are always gaps. Some t an immigration rule may not be completely, totally clear. I mean, insurmountable obstacles, it's not really clear, is it? What does it mean? Does it mean something that's completely, totally impossible? Or something that's very difficult? Or what, or what, or what? These cases have been through the courts for the last three years. Courts say, well, first of all, the Home Office is entitled to write harsh and strong immigration rules if it wants to. There's no law against that. Uh, courts have been slightly flexible. They say that insurmountable obstacles should not be taken 100% literally, literally, because something that's an insurmountable obstacle is something that you cannot surmount. It's not doable, not possible. Courts say, no, it doesn't quite mean that exactly. It's not 100% harshness test but it's something fairly close to it um, so the court said well th this scheme is legal um, I really think the best way of knowing or understanding what it means is to look at the Home Office published policy guidance that tells us a lot um, it says um, <laughs> it says it doesn't mean it literally but it's a, a high test a high hurdle as we say um, and, and they tried to give some examples of where the insurmountable obstacles test would be met. For example, let's say the sponsor is an ex-asylum seeker and uh, an ex-refugee. Or actually, it could be a refugee still. You couldn't expect them to go back to um, Pakistan or Iran with their um, applicant partner if they successfully sought asylum from that country because it wouldn't be legal, would it? Home Office says, we accept that you will be persecuted in your home country. We come to let you live in the UK. That wouldn't be right. That wouldn't be legal. That would be a very strong case for insurmountable obstacles because sponsor could not go back to live in their home country. That would be a very strong case. Another very strong case indeed. Let's say it's a um, same-sex relationship. Let's say it's like a country where same-sex relationships are illegal and criminal offences. You couldn't expect them to go live there, could you? That is a very, very strong case. Other possible strong cases, serious health issues. Now, there was a case in the High Courts a few years ago where um, somebody said, I couldn't go to live in that country, it's too hot, it would affect my health, and I've got very good medical evidence from my doctors that I, I couldn't live in a hot country like that, it would make me ill. That could be a strong case. I have a, a, a strong case of my own, from my own experience. Um, finding it strange and interesting story, I was in the first tier immigration tribunal one day, I had such a case like this, and we thought that we might lose and the Home Office lawyer was strangely friendly to us and we had a break and he gave us some advice for whatever reasons, maybe he was in a good mood that day, he said look your case is an average case you need something stronger to show insurmountable obstacles, you need something extra and something stronger and I thought hmm turned out there was something that I didn't know about the sponsor, when he was giving evidence to the judge, he suddenly said, um, oh, well, I've got 16 grandchildren in the UK. The judge says, what? He says, yeah, I've got adult children in the UK. They have children. I've got 16 grandchildren in the UK. And the judge looked at me and I said, I don't know. He never told me. Uh, and this, this, this evidence suddenly emerged in the court hearing and the judge allowed the appeal because... The sponsor had such strong human rights connections with the UK, children and loads of grandchildren, 
to judge an out of the appeal. That's something that uh, could be, Spons has got very, very, very strong, not just average human rights, but very, very strong. He was an elderly man. He had very, very strong family connections in the area. That could be something that could win the case. Now, we didn't get our, our expenses back from the appeal fee because we introduced the evidence too late, but that didn't matter. The, the overall point about this is that for insurmountable obstacles test, you need something stronger than the normal, normal, something stronger than the average. You know, all these lawyers, they try these things. Oh, a sponsor is a, an English person. They don't speak any foreign languages. They couldn't learn to speak a foreign language. They've got family in the UK, you know, here and there. And they've got a nice job. And it would be too much to expect them to uproot their life. The way things are, that doesn't work. You need something bigger and better and stronger. Um, I can't give you an exhaustive list because there isn't an exhaustive list, but I've given you the examples that I read from the Home Office's own guidance. We must assume that Home Office caseworkers will follow their own guidance. And I've given you examples that I know from my own experience. <coughs> now, Mr. Shaw, I can see you're brimming with questions. Would you like to interrogate me about this? Yes, please. Thank you so much for elaborating on this such a complicated topic. Um, furthering on from that conversation where you left off, let's discuss some scenarios where, where we find our clients usually in and see what might be a remedy for them. If somebody is an overstayer, which means they entered the UK, let's say as a visitor with a valid visa, overstayed for about a year, got into a relationship with a British partner um, and they would like to live in the UK with their partner for for um, reasons that they, they don't want to go back saying they may not get the visa to come back, that fear of not getting entry clearance. Well, that's how um, a lot of people would instruct their lawyers. They don't want to go back home because they, they might never come back again. This is, this is a common, common, normal experience. Exactly. How strong that application is um, if, if not more information is known? Well, it doesn't really go anywhere. Um, home office is not really interested in whether they fear that they're not going to come back again. That's nothing to do with the home office. Um, judge in the first year immigration trial doesn't really care about that. The judge will care about legal grounds. You know, the, the fear. This is not like an asylum case. You know, I have fear of um, fear of returning to my home country, but it's not an asylum case, is it? it it's it's a spouse visa or partner visa application. That's not going to go anywhere near deep enough to be. Brutally frank with you. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, I mean, if it, if they say something like, um, "Oh, I think I'm going to be persecuted because of my uh, race religion," then it becomes an asylum issue. But the way that it is at the moment is, it's not, is it? It's a family visa application on the appendix F M. Sure. Um, another scenario we we could discuss is where somebody is in the UK with a valid visa that allows them to switch to a family visa, like mm. spousal visa, however, mm. they may not be meeting financial requirements. So let's mm. say mm. the applicant is on a student visa, mm. he wants to switch to a family visa, yes. but they're unable to meet the financial requirement. Yes. Could they potentially submit an application under FLRFP because they're not meeting the yes. financial requirement? Yeah. But I mean, they're going to come up against all the normal tests for FLR or FP. The fact that they, they only don't meet one requirement doesn't really help. They don't meet all the requirements that they need to, so they, they're going to meet the full regime for FLR or FP. Sure. And for example, assuming if there were any health issues involved, such as the sponsor had such drastic health issues, they couldn't go and live abroad because they were in proper care of their GP. Uh, Could that uh, strengthen their application? It would potentially would need very, very good evidence because the Home Office are very good at digging up how good healthcare is in other countries. Potentially, yes, but it would need very good and well-researched evidence from a very top lawyer uh, like, like you, Mr. Shaw. Sure. And um, another scenario I would like to discuss is a case we've we've dealt with as well. Um, if someone has been trafficked to the UK yeah. um, and somehow they managed to escape um, being in the possession of the person they were yeah. and um, then they start a new life, they haven't gone back to their home country, their families disowned them, 
No, well, they, do, 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 do they hold leave or not necessarily? They don't hold leave anymore. Um, and they were trafficked and they didn't have the leave in the first place either. They were just trafficked illegally. Yeah. Um, and this person now falls in love with another partner mm. and they, they meet all the requirements, financial requirement, relationship requirement, accommodation requirement, English language requirement. Mm. But this person doesn't have a visa, mm -hmm. a valid visa to mm. start with and there is no one to go back home to and the family doesn't really want to see the applicant what how what would the merits of the case look like um should they make an application for it well it's difficult for me to say exactly what the merits might be it depends it, it's, it's factually very it needs to be put in context but um if they don't have leave they would have to apply under f l r f p they can't apply under anything else uh they will still have to demonstrate the insurmountable obstacles. Um, the fact that they were trafficked doesn't necessarily do so. It's very fact sensitive. All these applications are very fact sensitive. They would go under the normal regime. Sure. And in case of um, an FLRFP being refused, yes. um, you mentioned the, these can be appealed within the UK. Oh yeah, there, there will be a right to appeal in the UK. And if for some reasons, instead of appealing in the UK, the applicant had to go back to their home country in an emergency, yes. could an appeal still work out in the UK while this person is not in the UK anymore? Um, yes, but would it not be easier for them to make a, a new visa application? Because a visa application sorts out the whole thing. You, you just suggested that they could meet every requirement apart from the lawful uh, residence. Mm -hmm. If they met every other requirement, why wouldn't they just make a new visa application? That's very often the easiest solution. A lot of people, as you correctly indicated, they just, for psychological reasons, strong psychological reasons, they don't want to go back home. But if they have to go home anyway, let me tell you, sometimes the best fight is the easiest fight. You know, why not make a, a fresh visa application? Having overstayed won't be uh, fatal to your partner visa application because that's the way that the rules work. Overstaying will be forgiven. I, I would say in some of that situation, rejoice, you can make a fresh visa application. You don't need to get involved with the tribunal. Appeals are always messy and complicated. They can drag on for months and months and months. That, that's how I would best answer that question. Great. I would also like to just share a small case study of a client we just dealt with him recently. He, he got his visa. Was This client applied for um, UK visa at four different occasions from outside the UK. What kind of visa? A um, couple of those applications were for visitor visas mm -hmm. and one of them was work-related visa mm -hmm. and one was some human rights application. Four of them were refused. A human rights application from outside, from the, UK. outside the UK to join his wife here when they weren't meeting all the entry clearance um, requirements. So the Article 8 application? Art Article 8 application. They were all refused and the two of the visitor visa applications he had done, um, the Home Office said he was um, alleged of deception of using some documentation that the Home Office thought they were not um, real. Mm. They, weren't, they weren't genuine, in fact. It's, exactly. Um, we, we, we looked at the situation and the client was previously dealing with some agent who submitted some documentation without his consent mm -hmm. and it, it's very possible that they, they faked those documents mm -hmm. on his behalf. Mm -hmm. Now we, we did an um, entry clearance spouse visa application for him but before we did that we did um, subject access request mm -hmm. to the Home Office, mm -hmm. studied all his immigration history, all his mm -hmm. applications and uh, at this point now they were able to meet all the requirements for spousal visa. We did a very um, strong application and, and they were granted the visa. So like you said... So what's your problem, Mr. Shepard? No, <laughs> so this is um, joining the conversation along with, with the part mm. where you said best to apply from outside the UK if you're meeting all the requirements. Well, look, it's very difficult to persuade someone who may have lived in the UK for some years uproot your life, go back home, because uh, I may never come back again, which I suppose is, is, is a logical thing to say. If you can persuade your client to, to go back home and do it, it's probably very good advice and they probably should follow it, but my experience is that most clients, they don't want to follow that advice. Mm -hmm. They feel comfortable in the UK, it's, it's nice, the weather is um, 
gorgeous and <laughs> not, not too hot. Most clients, they don't want to do it because it's this psychological thing. Once you're back home, who knows what's going to go wrong. Um, I, I would say it's actually probably very good advice because it's less stressful. If you go back to your home country, I mean, maybe you don't like your home country, um, but you won't have to be there forever, probably. If your clever lawyer tells you, your, your competent lawyer tells you that you've got a good, strong application, probably it's going to be successful because you're applying for a family visa and previous issues about deception and overstaying that may not be held against you. If your competent lawyer tells you that you've got a good application, probably he or she is right. And should it be refused, there, there is a right of appeal as well. But, you know, in life, a lot of advice is good, good advice. A lot of people don't want to follow it because they've got strong psychological reasons and humans are governed by their psychological feelings and ideas, aren't they, pretty much? True. Brilliant. Thank you so much for elaborating on this topic in detail. And we we'll see you in our next vlog. Yes, it's been a pleasure.